It's time for the only wrestling podcast on earth with one two-time MLB All-Star Comeback Player of the Year, Dimitri Young. What's up, Dimitri? And we're going to get this right. It's head coach Dimitri Young right, now. Right. Dennis, let's go. Yeah, but, you know, I still have to intro you. I mean, you have the All-Stars and the Comeback Player of the Year award, right? Head coach. Head coach Dimitri Young. Two-time X Division champion, PD Williams. How is she going, eh? And then one of my favorite all-time people in the world, from the band Rancid, Lars Fredrickson. How are we all doing tonight, guys? Doing good, guys. We have on a returning guest, somebody I'm excited about. Petey reached out and got him, made it happen. Pete, this is your first time interviewing him. Uh, this is our second time. I think Lars' is first time as well. So, Pete, why don't you introduce our guest? Oh, wow. Well, uh, let's start off with this. Uh, he is the... Uh, the leader of, look at the shirt right here, Violent by Design on Impact Wrestling. You can catch him every Tuesday night, um, soon to be Thursday night, on Access TV or Twitch or wherever you watch your Impact Wrestling. He is a former, I don't know, Grand Slam champion at Impact, former WWE. He's been everywhere. Uh, my good friend of 20 years, uh, Showtime, Eric Young. Eric, how you doing? Uh, PD, what's going yeah. on, boys? Uh, guys, this, yeah, second time. Uh, I said anytime you wanted me to come back, you didn't have to get PD to ask. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, happy to be on here with Pete, man. Known him forever, forever. It feels like Dennis. You you start. You, you always set the mood, Dennis. Yeah. Um, you, you start off with the question today. I like how the flow goes when we do that. All right, you know what? I was wondering when when we heard you were coming back on, and we didn't get a lot of chance to talk to you about wrestling stuff last time you were on because Jason Kindle you know, hijacked the show and was really <laughs> interested in your outside wrestling uh, activities. I want to bring and start this off with more of a wrestling centric question and kind of say you were the head of a stable in WWE and you are ahead of a stable now. For us, fans we're not insiders we're, we're not dirty guys we're, we're true fans when you become a leader of a stable in either either company do, do you have any extra responsibilities on top of kind of watching over those guys or is it just they throw you in and you guys do what you want to do yeah i think it's 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 a little bit of both it's it's one like you mean i'm, I'm not babysitting them by any means that's that's not who i am or um <clears throat> what i do um but I think the the overall generality of being experienced, um, guys lean on you and uh, ask you questions and how would you do this or how would you say this or, you know, what do you think about this for, you know, an idea for the match or something like that. So it's, I'm very hands-on uh, that way. I, I was in Sanity uh, in NXT. Um, Triple H um, invited it. He, uh, you know, allowed me to choose the music and, choose uh, our ring gear and and the almost the, the entire vibe of the thing was uh, a collaboration and it's the same with uh violent by design the the best thing about being at impact right now is um it is very collaborative and they want your opinion and they want to hear what you think and um i feel like they they almost listen to me which is is rare uh i don't know if it's good uh but they are listening and uh i, I think uh, the violent by design stuff for me, I, it's some of the best work I think I've ever done. And that's, uh, it's saying something I've been doing it for over 20 years. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to skip since we're talking about violent by design right now, I got a lot of questions I want to ask, but since we're on the topic, so, uh, first off, uh, the name, love the name. That's like one of the coolest, like stable faction names I've ever heard in all of wrestling. You know, you got, you got Joe Rhino, Cody, uh, yourself what, what do you see and you guys pretty much just started it's new it's fresh on the on the tv show what do you see as like the future like what are your goals do you have goals for like violent by design in the future and where it's going to be in the company yeah i you know we just i mean solely we just want to be a big part uh, of the total package of, of what uh impact wrestling is uh, i think that we've started that um I feel like uh, we've positioned it in, in a way and we've worked really hard on it that uh, the four of us going forward are going to become big time players in, in the storylines in the company, uh, in, in storylines crossing over it into other promotions. Um, I, I think we're going to be leaned on heavily and it's something that we all want. Um, it's by design, if you will, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I crave responsibility like that in wrestling. like. I want to be leaned on. I, I want to be 
part of something bigger than myself. I, I want to be um, relied upon. And that's something that I think I've always prided myself on. And whether you know I'm world champion or whatever, I've always just said, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm going to do the best at that thing. You know, whatever it is on the show that I'm doing, whether it's comedy or it's, uh, you know, killing people or threatening people or breaking people's necks or whatever it is that they want me to do, I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. And I think Violent by Design is, one, it's, 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 it is so different right now from everything else on the show. It feels different. Uh, the promos are different. They're allowing us to do a lot of stuff off site, which makes it feel really original and, and really creative. And it has a different kind of uh, cadence and a different kind of feel to everything else that's going on in wrestling right now. And that's, that's really hard to do because there's wrestling, it seems like on every hour of every day of the week. So it's to set ourselves apart is, is by design. And, and I think we're doing that really well so far. Yeah. You know, I'm with, I'm with PD on, on the name because it reminds me of like a rad fucking punk band name or a really great song. You know, when I saw, you know, uh, Cody going up there with a studded leather jacket and a shaved head, I was thought maybe my, my punk rock wrestling dream would come true right in front of me. Um, because I, I I think it's amazing. My question to you is: Is did you put this these guys together? Was this your idea? Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely was involved. Um, Cody is a guy that I've been friends with for twenty years. Um, the truth is, it's really cool to see um, him getting this shot in this different light. Because um, part of the storytelling of the group is is even in real life, Cody was in the same kind of position that I found myself in 10 or 15 years ago, where I was the comedy part of the show. And uh, I wouldn't change that. Like, I, I love that part of my career. Uh, I ended up getting my own television show because I was the funny guy on the show. Um, and I mean, the reality is, is I'm 41. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, I saved my body throughout those years because I, I, I didn't have to wrestle a lot. Um, so that was, you know, really integral for me and my, my success in my career, but he's in the same spot where he was kind of typecast as the funny guy, but I know that he's really talented and now he's getting to show this kind of different side and this edge and this physicality and, um, even on the mic, like he's, he's so underrated in the world of wrestling. And that's just because people haven't seen him. It's not that he can't do it. He just hasn't done it yet. So that's cool. Joe Doring is a huge part of it. You know, if people diehard wrestling fans know that he was a massive star in Japan, um, it's cool too that uh, Joe was a guy I remember him training at Scott's and, and meeting him like during like the first two or three weeks that he was in the business. And then our paths crossed a bunch, but we never really worked together. And then he went to Japan and uh, became a big star there. He got sick and got cancer uh, and he beat that. And, and now he's back and he's a very huge part of what we're doing, man. And he's, he's awesome. He's just, he's so different than everything else that's going on in wrestling right now. And I love it. It's just, it's so cool. He's such a, just such an intimidating presence and just a big dude. And he cares about what we're doing. And that's, that's, that's what's important. And Rhino gives us legitimacy. I mean, he's a, he's been a, one of the most popular wrestlers for over 20 years. You know, he's, I just kind of said is, and it's not an insult to him or to Hacksaw. It's like, he's this era's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. It's like, he's just over everywhere he goes with every single crowd. So it's um, obviously, you know, they, they approached me about, you know, you know, who do you want the group and here's some guys. And I was allowed to pick and I knew me and Joe were kind of the cornerstones of it. Uh, and then we were going to go from there. I had pitched to add Cody because it was, was a surprise. Um, he's a friend of mine. I believe in him and his talent. And I knew that, um, he would pour himself into this because it's so different from everything he's done. Well, Eric, relative, um, I want to go back to your time in WWE, especially at NXT when you had Sanity. Dennis brought it up, but I was a big fan of Sanity when you originally had Madman Fulton when he was part of the group and then when you conquered and had the tag team belts, but then you go up to SmackDown and... Um, and as a veteran wrestler, I know like a veteran ball player, you, when you go when you go big time and, and you're involved in the playoffs and you find yourself sitting and not playing or doing what you want to do, you know, from that point when you came back and now you have this group, because I like the group as well, you know, I like I like factions and you've been in plenty of them in your illustrious career. So what are the things that you're gonna do this time? where you're going to have the success versus where you lost it 
so to speak, when you got called up with um, WWE? Because obviously they did not use you right. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's just about opportunity. And I think it's the same in baseball and it's the same in hockey and wrestling and, you know, acting and, and anything. It's just about having opportunity. And I, I was never given one there. They, you know, it, it's, it, it's, you know, I've said this before and I'm sure I said it on the last podcast. I'm not the first person that Vince McMahon missed on. I will not be the last. You know, it's, he's just busy making a billion dollar television show. And I, I don't ever, think it was anything personal. Anytime I talked to him, he was respectful and they took very good care of me financially and um, were always respectful to me and approached me with stuff that they wanted me to do and, and, and this, that, and the other, but um, there, there was never an opportunity, uh, you know, and I spoke my mind to him and I don't think he liked that. And I ended up on the outside looking in. So that's, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm a man and I don't, I don't have any problem with it. Um, I said what I said and I wouldn't change any of it. And um, like I said, I'm not the first person he missed. Uh, Kenny Omega is maybe bell to bell the best wrestler that this industry has ever seen. He he didn't last six months there. So like I said, it's I'm not the first person he missed on. It won't be the last. Uh, it's nothing personal. Um, I'm a believer in fate. I got it tattooed on the inside of my right arm. Uh, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And uh, I think I'm I'm putting out some of my best work ever. And and that's not just because it's recency bias. Like I'm doing it right now. So it seems I, I believe it. Like I, you know, won an award that was voted by the fans for match of the year, uh, won an award for surprise of the year. Um, and impact is growing in leaps and bounds. And I'm a big part of that. And, uh, you know, it's, it feels good to, to prove somebody wrong, man. I, I will never get over that feeling. You, you touched on a few things on my next question, opportunity and Kenny Omega, you come in the impact, you become the champion right away. It feels like you were the bridesmaid because as soon as they made the switch over the Rich Swan, which this question is not a knock on Rich Swan, he's a friend of the show, very deserving. But the, the second, it seems like the second thing made the switch, COVID hit, and then they pivot. And now they're into this whole forbidden door thing. You being the guy that was just right before that, and, and you see what's going on in your mind, what do you think you need to do to recapture that spot in impact? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's um, it, uh, my work speaks for itself. I, I don't need to to adjust or to politic or do any of that. That's not who I am. That's not who I've ever been. Um, it took me a lot longer to get where I am now, and and maybe I'd be more successful if that's how I was. But that's not who I am, and that's not how I've operated ever. And pd has been around me enough to know that that's just not who I am. Um, for me, it's just I'm just going to put out the best work that I can and let that do the talking. And you know, it's the AEW stuff is history making. You know I mean? Like I've been a wrestling fan since I was three and nothing like this has ever happened where there was, you know, two promotions that were on television on different channels, technically competing against each other are, are working in collaboration and uh, it's still going on. Um, they're just scratching the surface. I see it every day. People saying, Oh, when are we going to get the invasion? When are we going to do this? Like if we just do everything right away, there's nowhere to go. So, you know, they're handling it the right way. They're giving it bits and pieces, Matt Hardy and, and uh, house party showing up and, and, you know, um, LG and, and Anderson being a part of their show almost every week. It, you know, there, there's lots of places that it can go. I, I, I'm, I'm praying to the wrestling gods that this, um, this kind of joint venture continues because it's good for everybody and who it's most good for is the fans. Cause it gets them tons to talk about and the, uh, you know, the kind of, um, what is it? Dream booking and, and people talking about wrestling and talking about the two shows. And it's, it's super interesting. Would I like to be working with Kenny Omega and those guys? Absolutely. Uh, Rich is uh, an unbelievable guy, a crazy talented guy. The story we told um, with me and him, you know, the right thing was to put the belt on him and let him run with it. And he's proven that every single week that it was the right decision. And uh, I, I lose no sleep. I, I worry not about it. The, the world title is in great hands. Um, and my, my turn will come again or it won't. I mean, like the reality is, is um, I signed my first contract in 2004 where I could say I do this for a living and everything since then has just been cherry on top to me. And I, that's how I've looked at it my whole career. That's how I'll continue to look at it. So it's uh, it's been a wild ride and, and the, the world title is in great hands. 
but I, I feel like at any time I can slide right back in there because of the story we told and my position in the world of wrestling. So it's a, uh, it's exciting, man. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a wild time. It, it might not happen for a while. I was telling Petey this, but I, uh, at the last tapings, I tore my ACL. It's the first time I've ever been injured. I, I missed my first wrestling show this Friday that I was booked on, uh, in 24 years of doing it. So it's, uh, it's, it's it's frustrating, man. It's I've never been injured. I've never I've been hurt lots, but I've never been injured. Uh, I have to have surgery in like a week and a half, and uh, it's going to be a long, long road. So we'll see, man. It's going to get real interesting for me. So we, uh, hold on. All right. So threw us for a loop a little bit right there. Uh, I first want to verify. <laughs> <laughs> I first want to verify some things. Uh, you know, just for the the listeners and the viewers that no, you are not a politic. Or actually, you've, you've helped me out a lot uh earlier in my career and you still do i remember man we, i think we signed our first contract on the exact same day in 2004 i'm, I'm almost in, positive in the, in the dark in the back of the fairgrounds 100 percent. yeah I, it was just like here blindly sign this so and we did but yep. whatever we're, we're here now um but you, you also gave me man this advice you gave me and probably it was in 2005 and i still hold it and i still say it to other you know uh, pe people that are like kind of have a shitty attitude in wrestling that are kind of down in the dumps. I knew when I was younger doing the X division thing, I was, I was too immature to like, you know, they pushed me to the moon and stuff like that. And I just remember you coming to me and saying, man, wh why, why are you so pissed? Like you, you can either walk around all day with a, you know, like frowning all day. That takes a lot more energy than just, Hey, walk around with a smile. And I still use that advice to this very day. So I just want to verify what you said about the politics and helping out others and stuff like that. But okay. That totally disregards my question. So ACL injury. Yeah. Now what? Uh, yeah. You know, you're getting surgery next week. Uh, what's that look like for your future now? I mean, it's uh, it's just an injury. You know, it'll be. It's, I, I'm aiming for six months. Um, I've always been very durable. I've always healed very quickly. Um, but it's uh, my ACL is completely torn, uh, which I didn't know that happened on Monday during the match with Storm. And I finished it. Like nothing happened. I wrestled uh, a hardcore war eight man tag the following day. Then I wrestled Eddie Edwards uh, on Tuesday in a singles match. It was like 20 minutes uh, on one leg. And I would put that match against anything that airs anytime for any wrestling company anywhere in the world. Uh, and I did it on one leg and I'm very proud of it. Um, but yeah, torn ACL. So <laughs> you guys are breaking the news. Eric Young is a torn ACL in his. Is out six to nine months, so it's my first time ever dealing with anything like that. So it's uh, like I said, I, I've wrestled hurt, wrestled with a broken ankle, I've wrestled with broken fingers and broken toes and dislocated hip and all kinds of other stuff. But um, the my doctor said I, I can't wrestle, so I had to cancel my booking this weekend and I got to get surgery now. Can I jump in for a question and ask what does this mean at least for Violent by Design going forward? Are you still going to be kind of part of impact in a non-wrestling role? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the plan is. Um, that's for people that make more money than me. Um, <laughs> uh, Scott Demore, uh, I would imagine that I would still be involved. Uh, obviously, the physicality part will be very difficult. Um, like I said, I, I've never had surgery before. This will be my first surgery, um, and, and I don't know how it will go. Uh, but I would imagine I'll still be very involved in, in Violent by Design. Um, being the leader is like there's tons of ways we can get around that and the storytelling and stuff like that. So um, uh, I would imagine it would surprise me if they take me off TV completely because we're rolling right now. And I know that there is a plan in place and um, I don't technically need to be there for that plan to come to fruition. But I am uh, placed as the leader. Um, I want to be part of it. Uh, I, I will do whatever they ask me to do. Um, that, that will not be a problem. It's, I work right here in town, so I don't have to fly. And if I had to fly, I would. Um, I, uh, I love wrestling. Uh, I love working at impact and whatever they decide is, is what they decide. So, but right now they're, uh, I just found out Friday morning. So, uh, we're all just kind of figuring it out as we go. Wow. wow. Well, you know, I wanted to, to make an observation and also give you some much, res uh, due respect because honestly, I think, Rich Swan, no disrespect. I mean, he's a phenomenal talent, but I think it took an Eric Young to elevate him to the place where he is now. I, you know, and that's that's just my honest opinion because what the the chemistry you guys had 
the believability, the psychology of the way that you guys both worked, um, it seemed like you pushed each other a lot. So I just want yeah. to kind of do that so you hear it from my voice. But what I wanted to know is, you know, a lot of people think of impact as like the stepping stone to get to, you know, point A to point B. And honestly, in the last year that I've been watching the program, I feel like it's it's here to stay. And I want your opinions on that now because, you know, you got like what Dennis always says, this fourth wall has been sort of smashed down and there seems like there's more opportunity for wrestlers in a bunch of different places. And I think a lot of wrestlers are now, you know, finding their loyalty with a certain company. And um, I don't think that impact is that stepping stone no longer. I think it stands on its own. So I want your opinions about that, number one. And number two, just the creative aspect of what's in impact, how that benefits the wrestler. Yeah, uh, so the truth is, is, is the more places to work, the better it is. You know, I, I'm looking at it through the wrestler's lens because um, that, that's who I've been. I, I'm not in management. I, I don't make any of those decisions. Uh, and I'm glad that I don't. There's a lot of responsibility there. It's uh, it, it's um, impact, I think. I mean, it, we've proven this year during, uh, you know, a global pandemic uh, as a show that exists solely on on television and on digital platforms it's growing you know i mean we, we they just re-signed a deal to, to be seen in the uk and ireland again um uh, there's a huge uh deal that they signed with pluto that uh, allows them to be in south america and, and and other places all over the world that we've never been uh russia and and a bunch of eastern Bloc company countries um and the numbers, the television numbers are going up, the revenues going up, the buy rates are going up, the take, the Twitch numbers are going up. You know, it's, it's a company that I think if you were to break it down numbers to numbers of actual physical growth, I don't think any company grew like impact grew over the calendar year of 2020. Um, I'm not uh, smart enough to put all that stuff down and, and prove that I'm right. But I, I, I would be willing to bet that, um, the other companies, uh, you know, obviously are on a different scale and the WWE is making billions of dollars. And, the, you know, the, the quarter that they fired everybody because they needed to save money, that they reported reported their, their highest earnings ever during a global pandemic. And that, that's why they, they had to let 250 people go is because they needed to save money. So uh, they're not hurting, but I don't think they're growing like impact is. And, and I think AEW is the same. They're definitely holding and they're obviously on a bigger platform on TNT and stuff like that, but um, they're not expanding uh, and, and impact is, and it, it is baby steps. Um, but management has put us in a very good position. Um, guys are going to, work here and, and and get over and go other places and and more power to them but don't ever forget where you cut your teeth you know and don't ever forget who gave you opportunity first and uh that's important it was always important to me um you know i, I left this company too um but i did it the right way and um I, I don't think you could look through any interview i've ever done i've never spoke illy of the company and i could have uh, but I don't. It's, that's that's just not what a professional does. And um, you know, sometimes you got to remember where you came from, and that's that's important. And on your second question is the creative side. Is the cool part at Impact is like I said, it's very collaborative. And as a person, like you know, as somebody as creative like Lars, you're in a band, you know, and and being a uh, part of collaborating and part of the music is what makes it good. You know I mean like if someone just says this is what we're going to play, and you just play it. I mean, that, that can be rewarding too, but if you're writing the music and you're deciding, you know, kind of what you're doing, that's when you become invested. And, and I think you see it in the product is, is people have a say, and we're all pulling the rope in the same direction and having say in what you do, maybe not, you know, the outcome, but and how you get there and how the story is told, um, it, it, it creates buy-in and buy-in creates believability and believability creates good television. And, and that's that's the recipe. Oh man, that is dang, that's good right there. But Eric, I wanted to talk to you and Petey about when y'all first came into TNA together under the umbrella Team Canada, and y'all were a lot younger back then. And so, what was y'all's aspirations? You know, as young wrestlers back then, you know, putting it together. You had Bobby Roode, you had Scott Diamor managing y'all, and who's the one big strong blonde dude? Um, a a one, a one, yeah. I just want to hear uh, a couple of stories about you know your upbringing because both of y'all are here tonight, right now, and 
you know how it is when y'all go back way, way back. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. You take that one first. <laughs> I, I mean, well, I mean, I'll I'll speak on your behalf because I think we could this kind of leads into a question that I kind of want to ask you, put it out there. Don't know if you know people kind of know, but um, you know, obviously showtime, he was you were doing a lot of explosion matches and stuff like that. And he wasn't in the first team Canada. It was actually like uh, Teddy Hart, Jack Evans, who's not even Canadian, uh, Johnny Devine and myself. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, they did that. We, you know, we, we so I, I don't think yeah. we, ah, whatever. Uh, I don't think we really got over. Right. And I know uh, that they always had in mind, Eric as being part of team Canada. He's legit Canadian. He lived in Nashville. Like it, it just, it made sense. I think, wasn't it because they didn't want it because, oh, they already saw you on Explosion. They just kind of wanted some new, fresh fade faces and stuff like that. So yeah, there well, part, that part of, it, part of it was that, but part of it was I was living in Canada and um, had troubles getting across. And then I, uh, the crazy story, I, I gave my house that I owned to my buddy, closed my wrestling school, quit my job, married a girl, one of the cage dancers from TNA, which is a, an interesting story. We got married <laughs> and... Uh, and then I ended up in Nashville, and then it was like basically three weeks after that is when they signed uh, me to the contract with the, the original Team Canada for four shows. And I think, uh, like Petey probably agrees, like we we're just trying to to get more dates. I mean, it literally, I, I wasn't thinking long term. It was just like, man, like we got these four, we got these four shows during the X Cup. Let's just go all in and do everything we can, and maybe we can get kind of a full time gig out of this. And and it, and it happened. People hated us. I don't know what Canada ever did to the United States, but they. They, they hate us. They hate us. And I, I remember too, um, you know, like that's just, like our aspirations were just like, hey man, we want to get. And I remember at the end of it all, they, they, they were, they said, okay, we're signing Bobby. That's it. And A1 wasn't in the group at the time. It was Johnny yeah, Devine. Johnny they Devine. said, they said, we want to sign Bobby. And then I, and that was that. And it's like, okay, yeah. guys, you know, good luck. You guys got some TV exposure. And then literally a week before, uh, we went on Fox sports net down in Orlando. They said, Hey, we're signing all you guys. We want team Canada. You guys are awesome. Uh, you know, the reason why we're signing is cause you know, you need to be under contract to be on our television show. And we're like, okay, sure. And I remember, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but like for whatever reason, and I don't know who, who was making these decisions, but I remember they were looking at Eric young and they were like, yeah, man, we're going to cut him. Do you, you remember that stuff? And, uh, and then, I was like, huh? happened a couple times. Yeah, but I remember that first one. Like it, it was like, and then you went out there, and you had yep. like the match of your life, and then that saved your job, and your your career just skyrocketed it from there. I don't know why it took them so long to open up their eyes, but I, I don't know. Maybe do you remember that? Can you? Can you explain oh, I, I remember it vividly. It was uh, we did the run with Fox Sports, and uh, me and Bobby were NWA tag team cha champions at the time. We we're going into Victory Road. I want to say it's 2006 and oh, cool. the contract, yeah. our original contract was up. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, we're going into victory road. We're wrestling America's most wanted on the pay-per-view. Dusty Rhodes is in charge. Um, mm. And I had got word through Bob Ryder and a couple people is that they weren't going to renew my contract. And I couldn't believe it. You mean like I'm one half of the world tag team champions. We've got nuclear heat as team Canada. Like the group itself is awesome. Um, I think you're the exhibition champion at that point. You know, we're, we're running really hot. Like we're, we're a huge part of the show and they're just going to not renew my contract. So, I mean, like there's nothing I can do about it, except like I'm going to just go out and have this crazy match. And I went up to Dusty Rhodes and I said, I know you don't know me very well, but, and I know that you don't want a lot, don't watch a lot of the, a lot of the pay-per-view because you're busy, but you're going to watch this match. I'm going to show you why you're making the biggest mistake of your fucking life. And, uh, if you watch Victory Road 2006, that, that uh, was uh, an experience that night, and I was I was fi I was fired up. And Dusty Rhodes, to his credit, um, I came to the back and he hugged me and he said, "We'll make sure d don't go home. Come tomorrow, you you'll have a job." So um, that's that's exactly how it happened. I I, uh, I wish it didn't happen that way, but it's kind of a good story. Well, it's a great story. Wow. Well, I mean, I think we hit the nail on the head on that, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'll let someone else ask for I think we're all right. Oh, we fucking cuss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to ask another question if you guys are, are going to. Uh, Go for it. All right. So you took us through like 2006. Okay. I left the company 2009 ish. Um, you, you know, you were still, man, your, your career just, 
you were the one that got pushed out of uh, Team Kennedy. Did the, the the paranoid don't fire Eric stuff. Uh, great stuff. Did the super Eric. Did a whole bunch of other things. You did twelve years with the company, and then I think it was like two thousand sixteen. Um, that's that's when you were done with the company. What what happened? You said you left on good terms, but what happened there? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, like you know, you guys, uh, I'd just been there for so long and kind of had done everything and. Uh, the company itself was was shrinking for sure. Everyone that worked there at the time could see it. Um, you know, we had just lost the spike deal and then we went to whatever it was, Destination America. And then we were there for six months or whatever it was. And then it moved to pop. And I'm like, I don't even know if I have that channel. Like, I don't, it, I mean, it, it, the company was shrinking. The business of the company was shrinking. And they went from doing house shows every week to, you know, three a month to no house shows. And we're doing these crazy blocks of taping where we're taping, you know, eight, nine days in a yeah. row and stuff. And it, it's just, it's brutal. It's just brutal. And you're just getting so beaten up. And and I had kind of accomplished everything, you know, 10 times more than I ever set out to. Um, and I knew that the, the WWE was, was perhaps going to have interest. And I um, mean, you know, obviously it was a dream of mine to work there. Um, NXT at the time was the hottest product in wrestling. Um, I, I don't think there's any argument in 2016. It was the most talked about product, especially in the wrestling world. Um, and it was just growing like crazy. And uh, I believed if I became available that they would be interested. Uh, I didn't know for sure, but I believed that they would. And, and I believed in myself. And um, if not, I, you know, I was interested in going to Japan or, or just to do something else. So I kind of informed them that I, I wouldn't be returning for my um, my final year of my contract. So my contract was one more year and I didn't want to I didn't want to continue with the company anymore. And we agreed and I finished up there and, um, you know, um, put people over on the way out and did everything the right way and 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 moved on and uh, went to NXT. And it was amazing experience working there. But, yeah, it was just 12 years. It was just kind of like done. You know, I, I, I had kind of done everything that I had wanted to. Um, at that point, and the and the company itself was was in a downward spiral. It had this kind of like black cloud over it, and it didn't matter how hard we worked or the you know the product that we put out. People just shit on it. So it, it was a, a frustrating time to be there. Um, and anybody that was there at the time, I mean, they I guarantee you they tell you the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, it was just kind of time for me to move on, and and I, I I'm glad I did. I, I uh, live my dream of working for the WWE and I, I'm still really good friends with, with triple H and a lot of the guys that, that work there. And um, yeah, it's, it was just, it was just time, you know, you, sometimes you just know it was time. I, I, I was very comfortable there and was in a very good spot and was, you know, in main events and a big part of what they were doing, but it was just time for me to move on and try something different. You, you bring up NXT and us as fans, we always go, why doesn't he go to the main roster? What this and this, so then this might be designed as a news gotcha dirt question that I'm about to ask you is you get the call that it's time that they're going to bring you up to the main roster. You're probably excited because it's like going up to the big leagues, but is there a part of you that go, I don't want to leave NXT. This is, this is, we're safe. We're building something here. You don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously excited to, to, you know, go up to the main roster. That's uh uh, you know, it's all I've wanted to do since I was, you know, three years old is to work for the WWE and NXT for me, that's the WWE. You know I mean? My, the checks that came in the mail were from the WWE. The contract I signed was with the WWE. It was the NXT brand. That's where I worked. Um, but, but I worked for the WWE, the, the, whatever the five or six years that I was there. Um, we were all excited to go up, you know, for sure. And um, I think that they kind of had a real plan and, victim of circumstance uh we were supposed to debut on smackdown um we're supposed to go into a feud with uh new day and we're pumped i mean like this is three of the most over guys babyface act on the show three amazing human beings i still talk to all three of them love them dearly um three of my very good friends uh, in wrestling i was talking to big a a couple days ago actually um still play fantasy football with kofi creed has been a buddy of mine forever from the time he was consequences creed and yeah. tna um so we were pumped you know and uh they were in a six-man tag and i can't remember who they were working 
Um, but it was the main event. And then our music's going to, they're going to win and they're going to be in the ring. And then we're going to be at the top of the ramp and SmackDown goes off with us standing at the top of the ramp. Oh, who are these guys? Sanity's here. But like, and the match went long because it's live TV and that segment got cut. Uh, and that's what happens. And uh, next week we jumped the Usos, I think, and plans changed and we beat them up and then we were supposed to, to beat them in a tag the following week. And the circumstances that led to that, all kind of spiraling out of control was we're at a house show in Ontario, California, and Shinsuke Nakamura gets attacked by a bomb sniffing dog in the back. Oh, He's supposed to work Jeff Hardy, uh, who is the U.S. champion, and he can't work because he had to be taken to the hospital. He's got these bites all over his leg. And in the meeting, it comes up, well, we need a heel to work with Jeff. And Brian James a very good friend of mine. I know he's in the hospital and I hope everything's okay. Um, stood up and said, Eric Young is ridiculously talented. He could work with Jeff. And then they're like, well, okay, that's great. Let's do that. And then it was like, well, he can't beat Jeff because he's new and you know, Jeff's the U S champ. So how do we get out of that? Well, then we'll have the Usos run out and we'll make it into a six man tag. Well, we can't have the Usos lose because they're tag champs and Jeff is the U S champ. So our first match on SmackDown, we got beat. Mm. I remember looking at the other two guys in the group and said, guys, start thinking of other things to do because sanity's dead. Like they broke our legs before we could even walk. Um, the first time wrestling, we, we got beat cleanly in, you know, in a, in a six minute match, we're done. So it, I don't think it was ever by design. And it, you know, it, it just was this weird spiral of odd circumstances that led us to that. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's how it went, man. That's how it works sometimes in wrestling. It's a wild business. Damn, that was a terrible story. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> Faithful. Well, I, I think, you know, you hear a lot of those stories about, you know, the WWE and guys going up there and it feels like their legs get sort of chopped out, chopped off underneath them, you know. Um, so I mean, how did how do you carry on without you know that with that kind of pseudo sour taste in your mouth, and uh, you know what do you do? I mean, as a wrestler, I mean, I know as a musician, if you know some shit happens, it's probably an easier way to come back to it. But as a wrestler with TV and everything else, it's like, what do you do to sort of you know hit the reset button and like work through it? Like, what's the mindset there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously tough, but I mean, uh, I mean, like Petey said, like I, I'd almost been fired several times in my career, so it's it wasn't anything new to me, and it, it's just the nature of the beast. You I mean you're going to get knocked down, and you know, one second you're you know you're the world champion, the next minute you're you know you getting beaten up by the Miz on, on, on Raw. <laughs> you know, it's you know it's it's a wild it's a wild world, and and uh, for me it was I just. My entire time there, I can tell you, I never stopped believing in me and what I, I can do. And, you know, part of the conversation I had, I, I, people were like, just go talk to Vince. You know, he, he wants you to confront him. He wants you to, to talk to him. He wants, you know, I mean, even though he locks himself in his office and won't talk to anybody, they're telling me, like, just go talk to him. So I do. I just open the door, walk in his office. He's in the middle of a meeting. And I just kind of tell him what's on my mind. And. I told him what I've said in 50 or 60 interviews. I just said, like, if you've got a three hour show and don't have 10 minutes for Eric Young, then you're failing. And, and that's how I look at it. And that's my answer will never change. I've I'm not saying that I'm the best at any one thing because I'm not. I'm very good at all of it. And I don't think that I'm good. I've proven that I'm good at all of it. I've done comedy. I've wrestled women before it was cool. I've done tag team. I've done X division. I've been world heavyweight. I've been heel. I've been babyface. You can't find five minutes for something for me to do on your show. Then you failed as a promoter. You failed as a leader and you failed as a booker. It's as simple as that. It, it's a, it's a failure. Maybe not the most catastrophic, but I think it for the WWE, it's, it's top top five or top 10 blunders they've ever made that's coming from me and i'm biased but I, i'm not good at anything else but wrestling i can do the one thing i want to mention was when you brought up sanity when they brought when sanity went up to the main roster there was no nikki cross and i felt that she yeah. was the glue of the group now fast forward to now violent by design will there be a female in the group that's gonna wreak havoc yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, we're open to it for sure. Uh, I know that um, Impact is is 
kind of leaning on this uh, Japanese style where kind of everyone is affiliated with a group. Um, I think that Violent by Design is the kind of the catalyst for that. Um, we're kind of the first mega group or, or larger group uh, uh, of assembled talent. And I think uh, in the coming months, you'll see other people join up and, and become groups and factions, not where they're together all the time, but they're affiliated with each other. Um, obviously, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's, a, there's tons of women on the roster that, that could fit the bill and um, whatever they decide, you know, it's cool that they will, they will come to us. They will come to me and, and ask my opinion. And uh, I hope to steer the ship in the, the right direction. I got a couple ideas. I, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I, there's a couple, a couple girls that are working there right now that I think would, would fit very nicely with us. ODB. ODB. I mean, obviously, the story, the story's there. I mean, her two, her two, her two ex-husbands are in one group, so. <laughs> you know what? We've talked a lot about factions here, and it, it brings me back to the Attitude Era where there were tons of them. And then for yeah. whatever reason, you know, whether different eras of wrestling, they just kind of faded away and it was the not the cool thing. And I, I grew up on all that stuff. I love the factions. I'm an 80s wrestling fan. Yeah. You know, I would say five years or so was the real boom of the factions coming back. What do you think that's being a guy that's kind of been in one throughout your wrestling career? What do you think is the factor of bringing them back and why are they so popular again? Yeah, I think it's it's with a lot of things in wrestling. It's very reciprocal. Um, me and Eddie had this conversation, and hopefully, you guys will watch the match that we have. It's it, it'll air, I think, the Thursday just before Rebellion um, singles match. And we did we approached it in a different way, where as as the babyface, he controlled and and his you know him controlling the match was more about him holding on to me and being really aggressive that way rather than punching me and knocking me all over the place which you see all the time we did this like kind of really um old school uh like technical like ronnie garvin rick flair kind of vibe to it and i i don't know i haven't seen it but it felt really good and it um it's kind of like what's old is new again and I, I feel like kind of that's what's happening with factions like you're seeing at AEW with the, the pinnacle it, it is super compelling and very interesting um, with us. And I think, you know, uh, you know, the Bullet Club, I think, was kind of the start of that. You know, they kind of said, like, you know, like wrestling groups are cool. And I'm glad they did, because I agree. Like, I've I love the horsemen. You know, I you know, I've always loved factions and groups and I've been a part of several different ones uh team canada being the original and you know i got to hang out with four or five of my best friends and live my dream very early on in my career and i mean guys that i trusted my life with and and that can't be replaced so it's i'm glad it's coming back man and I, it's cool that violent by design is is kind of like the the start of that in impact which i, I really like you know i'll just say this in like 2018 ish when Sanjay was writing the show and it was before we had Jimmy Jacobs and stuff, I was like, dude, let's just bring factions back. And he was totally against it, you know? And I'm like, whatever. So I'm glad that factions are back. Uh, that has nothing to do with my next question, but I just want to throw that out there because I'm a huge fan of factions. Right. Um, and I don't really know how to frame this next question. Um, so I'll just kind of ramble and then hopefully you can answer it. Uh, so production, right. You've done, you, you know, you were an agent in WWE and stuff like that. I guess I want to know, like, uh, you, you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to wrestling. You know, you, you've taught me a lot of stuff. Obviously, I I, I do the, the production stuff now. It, it's a passion of mine. Like, I, I like doing that stuff. I like being involved um, in, in the matches and, like, putting my two cents in. But not, not like, overbearing. Like, you know, I've yeah. aged in your matches, so you know how it goes. Do you being another have, set of eyes. What's that? Being another set of eyes. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's difficult for what we do, you know, big time. Um, so like, is that a passion of yours to continue to do that? Or are you like, no man, like wrestling, I, I want to be in the ring or you know what I mean? Like what, what, yeah. what do you see? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's something that I'm definitely drawn to. I, I think, um, the faster guys can try it or, or at least understand it, the better it'll be for them it, as a young wrestler. And I don't think I understood it either. Um, and I think you would probably admit the same is you're part of a television show. I mean, it's not just wrestling, you know, being a good wrestler 
doesn't make you a good television wrestler. It's two different things. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm a decent professional wrestler, but I think I'm a very good television wrestler. Um, so, it, and it, it really is two things. And learning um, the production side and understanding all the other work that goes into what you're doing and how it's shot and how it's put together. And, you know, the masters that, that impact has to answer to, like, look, they got bills to pay, man. You know, if something that they're putting on the show and people are like, oh, what, you know, wrestling fans are like, well, why are they putting this? Well, they're putting it on the show because people are watching it. You know what I mean? The, the sad truth is, is wrestling actual matches is often the lowest rated thing on any wrestling show. Um, and I think that's the wrestler's fault for the most part, um, booking fault for not giving them, you know, not giving clean finishes and, you know, matches that are short that, that don't go anywhere. Uh, that's more our fault than anything, not the fans. Um, but I think if you can get involved in it or, or at least really listen to what the producers are saying. And, and I, I mean, it changed my life the first time in TNA I went inside the truck during a live pay-per-view. It is a fucking war zone. I mean, it is. It will give you the most anxiety of all time. People are yelling. They're switching cameras. You know, they, they're, you know, dead to rights at, at 1057. And the guys are still going through their finishing sequence because they want to do all these cool moves. And they're like, well, we're going to be showing a black screen if they don't hurry up and get to the finish. So yep. there's all kinds of stuff that's going on that I think an average young wrestler, especially when he first starts in television, doesn't fully understand. And I, I think you would agree with me, Petey, is knowing that and understanding what those people are doing and what they're lending you makes you a better television wrestler. The faster that you can understand it and the more you can use those other set of eyes to bounce stuff off of and, and listen to what they're saying. Cause often like you, like you've been doing this for 20 years. I mean, like you, you know, stuff that most of those guys can't even begin to understand because they haven't experienced it. And with uh, everything in life, I mean, nothing can out, outdo experience. So it's, to me, it's something that I'm definitely uh, interested in at some point. Right now, I mean, not with my torn ACL, but <laughs> uh, right now I'm concentrating on wrestling or, or getting back to wrestling in six months. We got well, time for one more question apiece, Lars. Well, what I was going to ask is, like, at what point does a faction become a stable? And, um, I mean, now that you've torn your ACL, is Violent by Design your stable? I mean, because, you know, we've seen that over the years where there's a manager. Because that's the first, I mean, let's be honest. that They were first stables, right? I mean, yeah. even the Four Horsemen, J.J. Dillon, or, yeah. you know, a million guys in the WWF, uh, at the time, WWF. So I want to know what your, your thoughts about that, number one. And uh, once again, really sorry about your knee. That sucks. Do yeah. yoga. I'm sure you'll be back soon. I should. I should. Yeah. But, um, and lastly, I guess what my question was going to be is, you know, and it's one of the questions that I, I always like to ask guys like you because you've been around because I think it's endearing. Um, was there a guy in your life, that it, in, in your professional wrestling career that, that helped you, number one, and, and who was that? And number two, is there a guy out there right now that's wrestling that you're like, man, that kid's got it? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the factions and stables, for sure, I think – Managers have gone by the wayside, and I don't really know why that happened. Um, I mean, I loved when I was a kid, like, I loved to hate Bobby Heenan, like, I loved to hate Slick. Like, I mean, these are some of the most, most iconic characters. Like, people remember these guys, you know I mean, like, and for whatever reason, we just went away from it. Like, the reality is this is because they're a good wrestler doesn't mean that they're good at talking. I mean, and I think you can see that on any show, any day of the week, there's guys that are, are talking or being asked to talk that shouldn't. Uh, and that's no slight on them. Like, I mean, you can do it or you can't, it's, it's really hard to learn it and get better at it. Um, AJ Styles is a guy that got really good at it. And when he was terrible at it and he would tell you that he was, and he worked at it, you know, and he got, he, he's, he's very good at it now. Um, but I think managers are just like this lost art and I would love to see it be part of wrestling again. And I think there's a few of them here and there. I know NXT does it a little bit, um, but I think I would like to see it more and, and be, you know, have actual full-time roles as managers on shows. I think it would be really compelling. Um, yeah, with the guys that helped me, I mean, it's a, how long do we have, man? It's a, it's a long, <laughs> a long, like 
Scott Demore, obviously a, a guy that I've known for 23 years, um, has helped me in a million different places along my career. Uh, learned a, a lot about the business of wrestling and how to be a professional and how to be one of the guys and um, was a huge part. Jeff Jarrett is a guy that helped me out a ton. And I know lots of different people have lots of different opinions on Jeff. Um, but I learned a lot about television wrestling from him. Dutch Mantel was um, a champion of mine, a guy that fought for me a lot. Um, Vince Russo, I learned a ton about what television is. And I mean, you can say a lot of things. I mean, I think Vince Russo has more wins and he's got losses and like, look, he's got a ton of losses. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and defend Vince Russo, but Steve Austin was invented by him. You know what I mean? And, and Steve is obviously a huge part of that. And Vince is a huge part of that, but the attitude era was from the brain and on the backs of Vince Russo. Uh, and anyone that says any difference doesn't know the truth. So uh, wrestling wise, uh, God, I mean, I, I, in a really interesting way, Shawn Michaels to me is the best in ring bell to bell. I don't think he'll ever be touched. Um, working at NXT and getting to work, you know, closely with him and how often our lives um, kind of uh, how many times we crossed paths. And I don't know if he knew it, but I, I knew it. And I, I actually wrote for ESPN for a little while. Uh, and I did a, uh, it's a really funny story. So it's take a little bit of time, but I'll get there as quick as I can. I wrote this, Basically, uh, the title of the, of the article was called uh, My Love Letter to the Heartbreak Kid. And it was basically how I, I idolized him and I wanted to be him. Then I realized, like, you know, I'm short, and I'm fat, and I'm ugly. Like, I'm never going to be the heartbreak kid. I'm going to have to do something else. But he just inspired me to how I move and how I sell and um, what I believe good wrestling is and what I believe good physicality is is and good storytelling comes from him. Uh, lots of other guys, too. But for me, he was... The pinnacle. Um, my very one of my very first times working for the WWE, I worked a dark match in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he. I'm sitting in the dressing room. There's this bag beside me, and I'm like, I'm like wondering whose bag this is. And he walks in. And I didn't know he was even supposed to be there. It's just he was just coming back from his back surgery and was getting ready to to go to do the Hell in the Cell and stuff with Triple H and all the other stuff. But it was like I think it was his first week back on TV, and he comes walking in, and like my heart drops. I mean, this is. I'm not a religious person, but that'd be like the Lord walking into your house and be like, Hey man, what's up? This is my bag. Let's talk about the weather. So I'm so nervous. Like I said, hi to him, took off. And then he's opening raw and I'm the dark match before raw starts. This is grand Rapids. I don't know what the arena is, but in grand Rapids there, this is when raw is doing crazy. There's probably 22,000 people in the arena. It's insane. And I, I'm the only dark match. They announced, they announced me from grand Rapids, Michigan. I, there's this huge ovation. I just got, I'm getting chills telling the story. Like I can still remember it today. The, the match was pretty good. Uh, I remember it. They tell you, look, they're not here to see you. Don't go out of the ring. Don't do anything interesting. Don't hurt each other. Just keep it real simple. So that's what we did. And um, we, uh, I went over, I think I beat him with a moonsault and I came to the back and, you know, I was kind of thanking everybody on the young kid, just kind of like staying out of the way. And Sean kind of grabs my arm and he looks at me. I'm getting choked up <laughs> saying this. Yeah. He says, Hey man, you know, no word of a lie. That's one of the best dark matches I've ever seen. And that would be like Jesus Christ looking you in your face and saying, whatever you're doing in life, you're doing really great. And like, from that point on, I never doubted myself again. Uh, the guy who I think is the best wrestler in the world said that may be one of the best dark matches I've ever seen. And from that point, like I knew that I was going to work on TV at some point. I, I knew it. And, uh, I talk about that and the thing and then him coming into NXT and being a big part of me and Sean Spears and I trained Sean Spears and, and we did this really cool cage match and Sean was a huge, was like all choked up about the match and how good it was. And anyways, it, it, it's a crazy story. I wrote an article probably on ESPN buried somewhere on their, their WWE site. But uh, yeah, that was uh that's a guy that, that definitely inspired me. And right now uh, as far as wrestlers go, like, impact is loaded. I mean, like guys like Ace Austin and a lot of them don't even know how good they are. Mm -hmm. uh, Trey is a guy that it, it just unlimited potential. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. Uh, Josh Alexander, I think is, uh, I mean, just incredible physicality and just believability. There's, I mean, there's a long list. That's the three Trey, Ace and, and Josh are, are three of the guys. Jake something is going to be a star for sure. Um, yeah, it's it's exciting to think that 
when I, I get this leg fixed, going back and all the opportunities that are there for me, man. It's uh, at 41. It's it's pretty cool to still be excited about it. Well, all right. So I have that. Did, did the HBK read that article? And then Lars, I'll step back. Sorry. So here's the, the best part of the thing. I, I know this is a WrestleMania weekend. We're at NXT TakeOver. We're opening the show in an eight-man tag. <clears throat> Sanity versus, I think it's Roderick Strong, Chris Hero, two other guys. I can't remember. Um, some fan will send you in and say he's an idiot. How can he not remember? And be two other guys that I should remember, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do remember this though. We, I, we did. They did this crazy eye makeup on all three of us for the, for a different look for for a takeover. And I'm I know that Sean's there. It's WrestleMania weekend, and he's always at NXT, but he wasn't there all day. So I'm like. Man, I wonder if he read it. I wonder if he saw it. Like, I'm, I'm hoping he did, and then I'm hoping he didn't. Like, what if he didn't like it? <laughs> I kind of, you know, maybe he thinks I'm a stupid mark now, whatever. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like five minutes from going out, and I see him come walking in one of the big bay doors, and he was off doing some autograph stuff. And I turn, and he sees me, and he yells, "Eric!" And I'm like, "Oh God!" And he runs, and his, his back's all fucked up, and his knees, he can't really run. <laughs> so he comes running over, and he just hugs me like I'm his child. He hasn't seen in 15 years. And he's like crying almost. And he's like, man, it meant so much to me. I'm getting choked up again. And uh, I'm like, dude, you're going to mess up my makeup. I got all this makeup on my eyes. Like, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> it was an unbelievable story. And he, he loved it. And he read it. And I mean, we don't talk, you know, every month or anything like that. But um, whenever I run into him, it's like we're, we're old buddies. And that is, it's just such a trip to me. I mean, this is a guy that I, I idolize. Like I had him and triple H's posters on my wall when I was, you know, when I was breaking into the business as like motivation and I stole them from Walmart because I couldn't afford to buy them. Um, Walmart's got lots of my money. They don't need any more, but yeah, it's a <laughs> thing. Like, we're still two of my buddies. The way that you described that was like the ending of a rom-com, you know, your makeup. Yeah. Comes That's what it felt like. It felt like I would definitely do a show with Sean where we're, <laughs> we're, we're together we're living in a studio apartment somewhere. <laughs> in <the studio. laughs> <laughs> the heartbreak kid. So, yeah. Sorry, thanks Eric, for your time, buddy. Anything yeah. else, guys? Yeah, I, I think we get it. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I got one. And All right. and and this is, you know, watching guys go from one company to another. And I know that sometimes when guys from the WWE go to another organization, I'm not including you because you started there and you came back, but like Guys that go to Impact, they go to AEW, and they and they get the stigma or a curse being a WWE guy. But I want to know the positive of working in WWE and going into another company because I know that they they work a lot behind the scenes on how to be presented on television, which you presented earlier. Yeah, I mean, like, look, like uh, you know, the WWE, my run on the main roster did not work out how I wanted it or how I dreamt it up or. Or any of that and that that's just life um but the truth is it's the pinnacle you know it's it's the it's the big dog it's it, it's the top of the heap it's it, you know however you want to slice it whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it, 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 it the numbers are absolutely staggering every week it, it's a juggernaut it's a media juggernaut and it just smashes everything it's 365 days a year it never stops and it, it produces like Fox didn't give them $2.9 billion because people aren't watching it guys. Like it's, you know, like Fox, you know, is one of the biggest multimedia companies in the entire universe. And they gave them $2.9 billion for the ability to air his show on their network. So, you know, like it's, he's doing it all right. Uh, wrestling exists. Uh, I'm living in this beautiful house in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, I have no debt and I, I live very well because Vince McMahon invented wrestling how we know it. And, and anyone that says any differently uh, is wrong. I mean, he's out of touch and he probably needs to step aside now, but wrestling, how it's seen now, how it's presented and guaranteed money and billions of dollar industry. This is his vision. You know, wrestling was not this, you know, he made wrestling what it is now and we all owe him no matter which way, whatever you think about him personally. And I don't have anything problems with him personally. He's just, he made a mistake. You know, it's simple as that. We all do. Speaking of mistakes, can you tell us one good Petey Williams story on the way out? <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably not. I don't, there is no good stories. Uh, let me think here. Where, I, don't, I don't remember where it was, but there was like a, <laughs> a, a, a male – 
hard body contest and we we just oh we dude it was in windsor it was in windsor like, when windsor yeah like dude like you're the most jack guy in here he's ah no i don't want to do it i don't want to do it i think we got a couple free pictures of beer and you want i don't really remember <laughs> you, you didn't want to do it like dude like you're easily the most jacked human being in here just take your shirt off and let's get some free drinks Fuck, stop messing around <laughs> that's probably the most craziest thing it pays right. to be good buddies with people that are in shape for sure <laughs> all right so eric thanks so much where where can people find you on social media the projects you're doing t-shirts uh that that kind of stuff yeah the t-shirts are obviously there's there's a ton of cool ones on impact shop shop impact.com um i got a bunch of my own on on uh pro wrestling tees uh the eric young uh, the eric young on ig and that's it man it's if you want to support me, you can. If not, it's cool. <laughs> Your next beautiful house. <laughs> I don't, I've never asked for followers. I, the, whole, the whole thing's weird to me. I've I got like 600,000 across all the platforms. I don't even understand. I, I have no opinion on anything. <laughs> I do, but I don't want to argue with idiots. So I don't, I don't put anything interesting on the internet. <laughs> Good. All right, guys, listen, uh, if you're watching on Fight TV, thank you so much for tuning in and watching Eric Young here with us on The Wrestling Perspective. Make sure you follow us on all major platforms. You, nice. Coach down there showing off his shirt. So, Dang, blouses. Nice. So thank you guys so much for supporting The Wrestling Perspective. Eric Young, thank you again. Good night, everybody.